Uh, so the department, I'm in the School of Interactive Computing, and uh, so Georgia Tech is actually uh, one, of those, one of the lucky places that actually has a college of computing in which we have three schools, computer science, computational science and engineering, and interactive computing. So our school has all the folks who do human-centered computing, so HCI, COGSI, um, learning sciences, social, social uh, media, um, social science, and then uh, vision, robotics, graphics, uh, I do augmented reality, I sort of sit between uh, graphics and, and HCI, uh, video games, that sort of stuff. Uh, so it's kind of everything about computing and how it touches people, okay. how it touches the world, really. Um, and so I guess I've been there 12 years, uh, and uh, the other structural thing that we have that's really uh, been useful to me is uh, the GVU Center, which is this cross-university research center that pulls together people from across campus who are interested in people and technology. So uh, the first semester I was there, I actually met a guy named Jay Bolter, who's a professor in digital media, uh, and he had actually just had a, written a book called Remediation, uh, which talked about sort of how new media whether it's, you know, back then it might have been the web or video games, now it might be augmented reality. Um, how when we try to create experiences, or more importantly when consumers try to understand these new media, they, they sort of naturally, implicitly, or, or explicitly draw on their experience with old media. And so for us, when we started talking and working together, that kind of meant AR, you know, you put on an AR head mounted display and you think, oh, this is, even without thinking it, you might think, oh, this is like VR but, or this is like film but. Um, and so it, you can use that to make experiences more understandable and, and, and so on. So that, so I've been working with, with the digital media folks the whole time I've been there as well. So it's sort of this nice multidisciplinary um, uh, space. So Jay and I direct the Augmented Environments Lab and uh, have digital media and, and, and computing and HCI and all these students working together. Um, lately, I've also been doing a collaboration uh, for the last three years, two and a half, three years, uh, with the Savannah College of Art and Design. So Tony, Tony Seng, who's a professor uh, at SCAD, and I have sort of collaboratively taught a class in augmented reality game design where we had SCAD and Georgia Tech students working together. Um, uh, and that, that actually led to a bunch of the stuff that people who are familiar with our AR games work have seen. So the, uh, you know, the ARG zombie game that uh, we did a few years ago was actually based on a game that we did in our first class we taught, and then the students who built it were in that class boat, and it was you know, two SCAD students and a Georgia Tech student who had been in that class actually built the, the, the first game, and then we got another student, uh, Georgia Tech, to help uh, finish it. So, so yeah, I mean, the thing that was most distinguishing about the environment that I'm in is the sort of support for nurturing of and possibility of collaboration across different disciplines. So Argon, uh, I guess the motivation of it follows this long path of, of research we've done. We, we did a, a set of tools called Dart years ago for Director, and the Macromedia Director, and the motivation there was that we wanted to put AR technology in the hands of, of a, a class of media designers, right? People who knew how to create media experiences using Director, because at that point it was kind of the de facto standard for creating multimedia. Um, and then we've done numerous things over the years. We've put AR in game engines, and, uh, and, and we built an AR client for Second Life. And, and all of these things were all about who do we want to experiment with AR, and how, and what are the tools they use, and we'll go to them. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, Alcatel-Lucent funded a project uh, that we did at Tech, which was this Mirror Worlds project. So we created a virtual environment of, of, of an area of our campus. We got models from uh, our friends in the School of Architecture. And we, so we created this little virtual world, and then we had a corresponding augmented reality client that you could walk around. If you were walking around in that part of the world, people who were sitting at the web interface looking at the virtual world would see your little avatar moving around, and you could collaborate and do stuff. And we uh, demonstrated a bunch of interesting apps that, or, or things you could do when you had this kind of, kind of experience. Um, and when the project was winding down, you know, the Alcatel Lucent folks and us were like, ah, oh, that was so much work to create like this one little thing, but it, it let us sort of demonstrate so many things, and we had lots of people who wanted to, both in Alcatel-Lucent, their clients like Verizon and AT&T, but also just anybody we showed to us, like, oh, could we get some, could we try this, or could we, could, could you create one here, right? And it's like, oh, we can't possibly do that. It's just, 
um, the creating these dedicated environments was hard. And so we stepped back and said, what kind of tools and infrastructure could we create to let people create these kind of experiences? And and as we thought about it, it's like, who are the people we want to support and who we want to support or the technological, technological infrastructure we want to support is basically the web, right? We want to allow people uh, to do things uh, as they normally do. Uh, and we want to allow, in particular, all of these creative folks who can do websites, right? Who can create their own blogs, who can build, you know, crazy things like Amazon, right? To, uh, to be able to experiment with AR. So we sort of went from how could we create, make it possible for people to recreate this mirror world thing to, okay, who are the people we want to support? Um, and so we worked our way toward the web, and it wasn't obvious at first that that's where we were going to end up because we really wanted uh, to, originally wanted to create some sort of something that had lots of 3D and, and was ideal for AR and so on. Um, and but as we thought about it, we realized that we can get most of the way toward where we want to go using web technologies, right? So, and, and current web technologies. So right now, uh, where the browser ended up, and, and, or where the project ended up as the browser is, anything you could create in, put in a div in mobile Safari. So any interactive web stuff that, that the WebKit implementation on the iPhone supports, can be put out in the world, on walls, on the floor, moving around, uh, and so on. And, and, you know, first reaction might be, well, that's like 2D, but the world is 3D, and not everything's a 2D billboard. Um, but a lot of what you people might want to do in, in AR is that's sufficient, right? Uh, and even, we've even had people do 3D by basically doing, you know, little flipbook animations of 3D content that they've rendered into transparent GIFs. And, yeah. Or transparent PNGs, and but then when you look at where the web is going, you realize okay, we're, we're using WebKit 3D right now to get stuff out in the world, which is this you know extension of WebKit, and and uh, uh, but but you know WebGL is coming right, or it's sort of almost here. And when you look at the trajectory that these things are going on, when you think about the new kinds of phones that we're going to have, you know, we've got little quad core phones by the end of the year, right? Uh, it's pretty clear that living inside the browser with JavaScript, and we start thinking about WebGL, it's like, we'll be able to do everything we want. Maybe it won't be quite as powerful as it would be if we were using Unity or something uh, more dedicated. Um, but the key is actually not what we can render, it's how it's created. So as soon as you... Uh, so with Argon, it's it's a web browser. Uh, you open it up, and you have a little. You can go to the, the the bookmarks and type in a URL. You go to a web server. If the web server has to recognize, either the web server recognizes Argon or the URL is just to a KML file. Feeds back a combination of KML, HTML, and JavaScript, where each of the KML placemarks is sort of a hunk of information somewhere, and then that information is created as HTML JavaScript, just like you would in a normal web browser. And the stuff could be fixed on the screen to create 2D interfaces. It could be relative to you to have stuff near you. It could be relative to the world. And, um, but, but all that stuff lives on the web, which means you now uh, can do, can tie to any of the cloud web services that you might do when you're creating any other kind of website, right? So. Um, we're excited to think about starting to experiment with mobile AR Facebook games, as an example, you know, here at GDC. Uh, and we've experimented with before, but it was hard, right, because you have to write a custom client, you have to do all the stuff. Now, um, in much the same way as you might create a Facebook game, you can now create an interface to the same server that would handle a Facebook client and have it handle, feedback the, the HTML and stuff and put it in the world around you. Um, I think th there's sort of kind of this spectrum of people who've expressed interest in Argon. On one hand, it's the, the, the low-end hobbyists who, you know, have some web, web chops but don't really have the ability to write Objective-C or C++ or something like that on, on Android or iPhone um, and want to just do kind of the equivalent of a little experimental web page. And then there's folks like um, people at CNN, right, we've talked to, uh, wh who have this vast investment in web servers and content, you know, they've got these databases with huge amounts of geolocated content, right, and they've got dozens, I don't know how many, hundreds maybe, of trained web developers, both the content people and the server people, 
who can now just repurpose all of that with a few scripts and all of a sudden be delivering mobile AR applications without having to build, port, ship, test, update a, uh, these native apps. So, and when you think about that sort of thing, you start, th there's, there's a spectrum of applications that couldn't be possible otherwise, right? So you look at a lot of the iPhone AR apps, and most of them don't need to be apps, right? So you look at like the Twitter round or the, these things that just put a little bit of data around you. They're, they're kind of cool, mm -hmm. but you know, how many of those apps could you have? And more importantly, now that the sort of initial excitement about being able to do AR on the iPhone is worn off, people aren't creating them anymore because the investment required just doesn't justify, isn't justified by the kind of app it is. Whereas, you know, uh, in the samples for Argon, if you go, you know, download it and you go look at the, the bookmarks, there's a, a, one of the sets of bookmarks is called sample searches. And we basically have on our server a few CAMEL files that have embedded in them uh, an overlay on the screen to let you type in a search term, and then uh, a bunch of JavaScript that goes off and connects to either Twitter or uh, Flickr or uh, CNN's iReports, downloads the data corresponding to that search, and creates a bunch of little HTML placemarks in the world around you. And this is just, each of these is like a few hundred lines of a text a KML file, a few hundred lines of combined JavaScript to HTML, and it does basically the same thing as one of those apps. Um, but you as the developer, if you just copied this code and it's all available, um, you could change the whole interface, the way it's done, you could experiment with layout and all this sort of thing and, and without having to do any native programming. And that's, I think, what's, what's exciting. Then what do you hope to see then in this coming up year for Argon? Um, so we hope to see sort of a lot stuff happening on a few fronts. One, uh, so we're creating it now, it's out there, we've, cr we're, we've created a website with documentation and forums and wikis, and we really hope to see a community grow that, that feeds that and uses it. Um, and uh, we also have, uh, are working with people in tech and hopefully elsewhere. I've got, uh, uh, already got talking to colleagues of mine around the world who are interested in using it to do, you know, research projects, right? So uh, I've got uh, colleagues at tech Two different uh, groups have submitted research proposals to the NSF to look at uh, education, uh, science education in both cases, different kinds, uh, where they want to use Argon. Uh, got, um, so, so we're hoping to use it to allow sort of uh, people who have research that they want to do to do it. Um, and then the other extreme, we just want to work with people uh, who want to tr experiment with real things, right? So, um, you know, I would love to uh, talk to you know, folks who would normally say put games on the web uh, corresponding to a TV show, right? But now we want to do mobile versions. Um, we've talked to folks at Cartoon Network. Uh, we're talking to folks at PBS Kids about how you could you could use this sort of technology. Um, and uh, sort of going down the mental list of the kinds of projects that we're already uh, talking about, we're talking to a few big companies about how they might actually base uh, a, a sort of a major system on this. So uh, we've actually even talked to a few companies who want to base their entire business model on it, which is a little bit terrifying for us. Um, the, uh, uh, so that, that I think is really interesting. The other side of it is we're, we're porting to new platforms to do new things. So part of what our research goal is this year, is ourselves, is to cr start creating uh, authoring tools. So creating KML, you know, creating HTML and JavaScript by hand without something like Dreamweaver is a pain in the butt, right? To edit it and then refresh it. That's why those tools exist. Jumping to this environment, you now have to create KML and put HTML in it. Um, we've personal, for our own work, we've hacked together some pipelines that use, you know, Google Earth to put stuff that kind of in the right place, and that dumps out KML, and then we edit it, but there's still nothing WYSIWYGY. So we're porting Argon to the desktop, to the Mac, so that we can use it to start creating authoring tools. Okay. And so we're going to basically create web-enabled authoring tools, um, some that will just use the normal web browser, some that will use our custom uh, desktop version of Argon, um, and some that will run on the handheld. And the nice thing, you know, now because it's all web server based, you can actually have these things running simultaneously, right? Look around with the phone, type something on the desktop. Right? Um, and finally, one of the things that uh, I've been talking to a number of companies about, uh, and it looks like we're going to be able to get the funding to do it, is support to uh, Android 
uh, I think that'll be a huge, a huge thing. Partly because the design, some of the design decisions we made to make it work on the iPhone are a function of the limitations of what you're allowed to ship on the iPhone, mm -hmm. right? So you have to use the built-in WebKit implementation. You can't modify it. You can't uh, install your own. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a lot of cool things we could do if we could make some very small changes to allow more efficient communication. Right? I'm also really excited about um, getting a version of, of WebKit on Android that uh, includes WebGL um, so that we can actually start uh, doing some 3D in, in, in sort of the way it should be done. Um, you know, eventually the iPhone will support WebGL, I, I'm, I'm sure, and, and so on, so we'll be able to, to keep that platform uh, going as, uh, as long, you know, up to a level that corresponds to whatever the built-in WebKit does. But uh, sort of the Android, the possibilities with Android uh, are pretty interesting. I know that you're involved with um, the AR industry and their discussions on standards and these mm -hmm. other things since Argonne supports this, uh, numerous different standards. What would you like to see for the industry in 2011? I mean, I'd like to see, you know, obviously more standards. We're going to be um, talking. One of the things we want to do by having forums and so on is to start participating and having other people participate and figuring out what, what Argonne should do and what it needs to do to, to actually be something that people would consider eventually a standard, right? I don't, I'm not, some people say, oh, you're trying to do a stand, uh, AR standard with Argon because we have, you know, obviously this whole KML HTML spec and, and a JavaScript library on the browser and so on. I don't think of it as much that we're trying to do a standard as we're trying to bootstrap a standard, right? Uh, you know, the history of HTML and a lot of the, Colada, uh, the Chrono standards and so on, some of them are designed from the ground up, like Colada. Some of them are just evolved, right? At one point, we use dynamic HTML, which seems to have disappeared a long time ago. Um, HTML5 kind of grew out of experience. What I would like to see is to have lots of people who are, care about mobile AR standards provide input um, and start engaging in conversation. We're going to uh, try to talk to people at uh, the AR event, uh, um, obviously at uh, the ISMAR conference. Um, I want to uh, take grow a conversation. One of my postdoc, Alex Hill, who's been kind of leading the, the uh, development of the browser, uh, uh, has been taking part in the, the W3C POI working group. Yeah. Um, and, and so we're very interested in pushing this because I think there's some very simple things that we know right now, like you know, ha having a, a full set of point of interest specs that everybody can agree on is important because it's kind of you know, base level. But there's a lot bigger things, like it would be nice uh, if we had a, a nice representation of uh, sensor error, right? So one of the things that Argon does uh, that grew out of a previous project we did was report the GPS error up, so you as a designer can react to it. Um, we had this notion of panoramas in Argon that originally grew out of um, originally grew out of our desire to be able to demo the browser when we weren't somewhere. Right? You know, we'll use a panorama that's been geolocated, and so the browser will think that it's at that location, and you can look around instead of seeing live video. It actually turns out that that's been so useful in some of the design projects that people have done uh, that uh, it's sort of a first-class feature now. But you know, when you're when you're at a panoramic location, you have a very accurate geocoded. Uh, uh, information and even if the orientation sensor on your phone is off, the panorama is off by the same amount, so you actually have really good registration in both position orientation. And so we pass that up uh, up to the into the JavaScript so that you, as a channel author, can you know display stuff one way, and then as soon as someone ch changes into a panorama or moves somewhere, and their GPS gets better. You can change what you're displaying. Having some agreed upon representations for that kind of error will be really useful because it's one of those things that is actually pretty vital to creating workable AR applications is to give authors the ability to know what the accuracy is and to change their content based on it. Um, and, and I think on and on, right? So uh, we're basically very open and excited by about getting ideas from people and just putting them in the browser, eventually everything's going to be open source. Um, we're not going to open source the browser yet because we want it to get to a big enough size that it's not just going to split apart into 20 different versions before, before it gets any um, uh, momentum. Um, but we are going to be sort of gradually opening more and more of it. So 
my, one of my students, Fafez, and I have been talking about how do we expose more and more of the JavaScript library that we're building inside of the browser so that people can, can modify it to a much greater degree uh, and, and eventually just will just be sort of hiding the bits that are required for the communication with the device so that, you know, just like back in the day when we all used X, X Windows on Linux and, and Unix, you could have your own window manager, your own um, uh, uh, look and feel to the desktop, right? And Linux users can still do that. If we expose enough, you know, going back to the X analogy, there was X, X, Xlib, X, you know, Xlib, XT, and then Motif and the open, you know, and all the other things on the top of it. Uh, so we want to expose as much, or lock down as little as possible and expose as much so people can replace it, right? So that your Argon experience might be different for the same channel than mine because you've got a, a different set of libraries installed in there. Okay. And it'll let people experiment and, and eventually come up with what the right approaches to some of these things are. Because there's some hard questions, like things like layout or, or aggregation, right? If I'm, uh, doing a, a Twitter channel, even something simple like that, there could be a thousand tweets around here. The easy thing to do is only take like ten of them and display those, but maybe I want to like do like a server uh, server client combo thing where, my, where I go via my own web server that collects these tweets and aggregates things and creates a tag cloud around me and then have the client be able to dynamically display and manipulate this tag cloud as I look around. Um, and if you can modify as much as possible on the client side, you could actually do some of that stuff, which I think would be really nice. That's very cool. Yeah, th th thank you for uh, answering those questions.